I lived in Kenya. I was appointed the first woman vice president of Citibank. Most of us have seen you when you're this big giant, you know, who has conquered and shattered glass ceilings. How did you even envision that you can be the first, you know, woman president in the continent? In a way, I had a long journey to reach that far. Aside from taking positions as a activist, I was part of the young activists in the society. The first time I participated in election was 1985. I ended up in jail because that election that was held was fraudulent and I took a position with my party that would not respect it, even though I was elected senator. She's Africa's first democratically elected female president, a Nobel Prize winner, and a mother of four amazing boys. She's also the 24th president of the Republic of Liberia. Ellen Johnson Salif is our guest today on Globe Traction, and tonight we hear from her on how it's been empowering women across the globe. Hello and welcome to Globe Traction. My name is Pasil Telewa, and hope you enjoy Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Salif's story. Ellen Johnson Salif is a leading promoter of freedom, democracy, peace, justice and women's empowerment. Known internationally as Africa's Iron Lady, Ellen served as President of Liberia for 12 years between 2006 and 2018. She led Liberia through reconciliation and recovery following the nation's decade-long civil war as well as Ebola crisis. She won international acclaim for achieving economic, social and political change. She is recognized as a global leader in women's empowerment. Besides winning the prestigious Nobel Prize for Peace in 2011, Ellen is also the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States' highest civilian award for her personal courage and unwavering commitment to expanding freedom and improving the lives of Africans. President Salif has been awarded honorary doctorates by more than 15 institutions and has been ranked among the top 100 most powerful women in the world, Forbes 2012, the most powerful woman in Africa, Forbes Africa 2011, one of six women of the year, Glamour 2010, among the 10 best leaders in the world, Newsweek 2010, and top 10 female leaders, Time 2010. In 2008, she published her critically acclaimed memoir, The Child Will Be Great, and for these and many more reasons, she makes it to the Globe Traction Show with Pasil Talewa. It's so nice to see you and see what you've been able to do across the continent. What drives you each day to wake up and, you know, see the need to go and do these kind of, you know, things you do? Because you have the option to just take care of yourself in retirement. You know, I think I'm driven by the situation of my own beginnings. You know, my mother and father, uh, were able to gain an education through a guardianship programs because they they had a majority of indigenous background and I had grandmothers on both sides that lived and died illiterate and so with the focus on education by our mother took care of us and an education for me and my siblings. I, th I think I was driven first by being someone with the will to challenge, to challenge the status quo, whatever that status quo, whether it what was in a classroom, you know, at an early age, or whether it was in part of a organization, at a school organization, or whether as, you know, a junior official in government. And I think 
that challenge enabled me to always stand out and take positions. And I think one step leads to another. Well, once you gain your respect through your values and your determination to protect those values and to promote them in whatever uh, entity or circumstance you find yourself in, I think that uh, deepens your own self-confidence. Yeah. Uh, it makes it easier for you to be able to identify your goals and the pathway that would take you toward the achievement of those goals. And in that respect, I also learned to know that I can't do it alone. There's no monopoly on ideas or knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and so you always need friends, family, who share values with you. And are willing to see you even when they feel that you're going to you're taking on steps that that will pose difficulties for you as it did for me. You know, uh, the consequences of challenging political orders always bring consequences. But um, I'm glad that <clears throat> those accomplices, whether family, friends, you know political supporters have been part of the motivation. And increasingly, the motivation by young women and young girls, you know, who now see me as a role model. And, and then I take on the responsibility that I represent their expectations and their aspirations. So I probably I try I drive harder, not for me anymore, but I drive harder for their you, success. You do, you do, and I'd like you to just paint me a picture of you growing up because most of us have seen you when you're this big giant, you know, who has conquered and shattered glass ceilings. So who was you? Who were you as a young girl? And how was your family? Well, you know, as I say, I grew up with the. A father who was a hundred percent indigenous, so one of our tribes, the Gola tribe. Uh, my mother was also half indigenous from the Kru tribe, but she had a she was a mixed tribe because she she had a, a, a German um, father uh, at the time when uh, German colonialists were. Uh, trading operations. Yeah, is, is that why sometimes they refer you as a uh, Libro in German? Yeah, it's because of that. But but when my mother was born, there was the, the war, World War, World War II. And America was at war with Germany. And Liberia being such a strong ally of the United States of America, Liberia expelled all the German traders. Of course, my mother then was only two or three years old when Germany is so old. She never knew her father anymore. Uh, so she lived with her mother, who was a, nothing but a, um, a, a crew market woman, you know. But like I say, the Liberian system was to have children of indigenous families given to children from the so-called American Liberian family yes. to enable them to get an education. Education. So both of my parents got educated through that method. And my father did become a part of the status quo of the political order until he got ill. Yes. Uh, but there are two things we learned from his illness when my mother had to take over. Number one, is we learn how to adjust from prosperity, poverty. I don't. When your father is yeah. gone and has no more income to support me, your mother is a teacher and preacher, and she has to carry the load of educating her children, four children. You learn to adjust. True. And it brings in you a humility. 
a humility which I have until today. Uh, the second thing about our parents that I've always retained a value of retain. They never forgot their roots. Even though they got educated and prospered, prospered for some time, we had to go back to the farm. As small children, we had to go back to where our grandmother was in the farm as a farmer. We had to go back and live there during vacation periods when other school we had to spend it down there. Yes. In the, in the field, in the rice field, or the okra fields, or, you know, with our grandmother. So when people hear me talk today about a farm, or they see in my bow that I call myself a farmer, it's because I too went back to my roots when the war Boy, thing was, was over. Yeah. To go back to where my father had a farm and where I went to a farm as a little girl. And, and the other thing is that my mother always taught us like I said, to be humble and to, to work hard, to believe in God. And so those things have carried me. But through your tuning, your tuning, you know, gave us a lot of motivation to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I would like to bring you back, you know, to what really made you a global sensation. Your winning of the presidency, 2005 and running the government of Liberia in 2018. How did that feel for you, Your Excellency? Well, in a way, I had a long journey to reach that far. Aside from taking positions as an activist, I was part of the young activists in the society. Um, and, and, and then I became part of a political party. And so my, the first time I participated in election was 1985. Yeah. That yeah. far back. But in between. You had been the finance minister. That's right. Yeah. I had left government. I'd gone abroad. I lived in Kenya. You did? For and just you about five years. It. Yeah. Yeah. I lived here because I was appointed, I believe, the first woman vice president of Citibank. I was not working in the in the um, the office of Citibank here. But I was working in the regional office assigned to do Citibank product promotion in neighboring countries. So 85, I left, went back home, uh, ran for, uh, for office. I was, I, was, I, was, I ended up in jail because that election that was held was fraudulent and I took a position with my party that would not respect it, even though I was elected senator. Yes, yes. yes. Uh -uh. But our party took a decision not to take office. So why did they first of all dispute your senatorial win? I mean, your senatorial win? We did. My own party decided we were not going to respect a fraudulent election result. What happened? Even though we How knew I won. won. Even yeah. though we knew yeah. I won. But we said, if I, if I took the seat, then I legitimized an the election. The credibility, yeah. 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 Because why? My win may have been, you know, so overwhelming that they couldn't deny me recognizing that I won. But most of the other, including the presidential vote result, was, was fraudulent. And so we took the position, we took that position and I stood by it, but it ended up being in jail. Uh, and it again forced me into exile. Uh, For how long did you stay in jail? Uh, about seven months in total. You know, are you given any better treatment? Or how were the conditions? I believe because, again, I was part of 
I was part of a young activist group. I was elected in a position that was whose results were recognized internationally. So inter interparliamentary unions stood by me. The United States Congress stood by me. And so the pressure, and then the women, mm -hmm. the women all signed appeals. So it was a pressure when it comes to, you know, mm. serving less time in prison than, than I would have. I mean, you know, I was, I, I was charged with sedition. And I went before a military tribunal uh, whose decision was that I would serve 10 years. But all of that did not last. Like I say, it was only several months because the pressure both at home and abroad was so strong. What made you even think about going for presidency after all, you know, the tribulations that have come with you running for senator? Well, because I had already laid the framework. I had earned the stripes. And it was not a time for me to give up. The ultimate aim was to break the gas glass ceiling, to set that example that it can be done. Even when the price you pay is heavy. Uh, and that by so doing, I don't think we'll see many women subjected to the same thing because I think they'll benefit from my experience, you know, some of my own shortcomings. And I, I think I'm just pleased in today's environment that, that I see women equally determined, but even stronger in spirit, uh, stronger in capabilities than it was in my time. And so I spend my time now just against doing more. I think we are very fortunate to have you, you know, set the best. <clears throat> but deep inside myself, I can't stop asking myself or wondering, because you prepared the way for us, but who prepared the way for you? How did you even envision that you can be the first, you know, woman president in the continent? Because this is something that you need. Well, you know, we had a lot of women on whose shoulders we stood. In my own society, you know, we had some woman who was the first African woman president of the General Assembly. It was a Liberian. Uh, we had another judge who put on her judge robes to walk the street with uh, revolutionaries to demand change in the society. You know? We had the head of uh, education. So we had these women. And then I, I looked afar. I saw the animism of, say, a Winnie Magdala, who stood in those early days. Oh, I see her. Uh, Wangari Mathai, what she went through when she was making this whole thing about the need for, the need for an environment had trees for the protection of people. Today, we just recognize it. Yeah. So, and, and if you look around, you'll find, so my, that's why part of my overall objective is to profile all of these women, not only myself, but to profile them and show uh, uh, all the women, and particularly I mean, young women and girls, that there's so many African women models that can strengthen their own desire and their own effort to take high positions in public service. Let's talk a little bit about the Amanda Initiative and your foundation, the Ellen Sally Johnson Foundation. What came to your mind to think about, you know, continuing with your le le legacy? Oh, well, the, the center, as we call the Ellen Johnson Sally Presidential Center for Women in Development yeah, has at its flagship operations, the Amuji. I think you've seen enough about Amuji. I don't have to tell you more. Uh, we have two other pillars. Uh, there's the research and communication, attempting to gather data 
about women, where they stand, so that it can strengthen the advocacy for our women who are on a, on a political or leadership journey. We need, we need evidence to show where they are and what the possibilities are and where the good records are in Africa for women in the executive, in parliament, in the judiciary, in non-governmental organizations, in international organizations. Um, and then where we have uh, the archives, the place where we gather the stories of prominent women who have made a difference and profile them for women, younger women, girls to see the, these women in Africa that have gone through a lot. They stand out for the challenges they made, for the differences they took, for the position they represented. And that's when we're gonna have a facility for convening women, you know, call it an African Women House or something like that, where you bring them together from time to time. And those young ones who want to do scholarly work based on the story of the lives of women, uh, the convening of meetings, Amuche women's with their mentors. Mentors are those women that have advanced very high level positions. Bring them together for exchange of experiences and strategies, formulation. Um, those are the three pillars. I hope that I can achieve yeah, and, and, it, and, and it is the thing to you as a mother, because women have to juggle so much when it comes to leadership, but I'd like your advice. As a woman who is having aspirations, you also have the society look up to you getting your family started or moving. How has it been for you? Because I understand you're a mother of sons. Tell yes, me about it. a mother of four sons. Maybe I was a bit lucky because I had them when I was young got married right after high school. And so, yeah. it's just a fact. Uh, so I went to school after. And when, when I had been a mother, but again, we had a good system in Liberia where if you had a chance to leave, to get training, to get education, you could leave the children with the grandmothers. So two of my sons were left with, with uh, my husband's mother, and the other two were left with my mother uh, to take care of them. Why the two of us, my husband and I went back. He went to school for a second time for advanced training. I went for first training. So that, that's how, it, so when we came back, of course, but then you know, when you're driven by hard work and an ambition to succeed, you know, in professional life or in political life, always leads to tension in the family. And the tension did come, and ultimately that tension resulted in a divorce. Um, but I was able to carry on, and he was able to carry on with, with his life. By this time, our children was, were much, uh, had grown up a bit more, uh, so when I decided to run for president, I no longer had children. I had, I had young men. <laughs> Most of them were on their own because they, they too had obtained an education in their early days with our support. And latter days, by their own effort and their own support, their own uh, abilities. Uh, but today, like I say, they all just became my young friends. My children became my young friends. But my my younger my younger children, my younger brothers. So that's it. Liberia right now is in in the hands of you know an ex footballer, George Ware. How do you look at his leadership, and what advice do you drop in you know once in a while? Because I understand you too. My position is, even though I'm not left the presidency, that I can continue to make contribution to my country. Sure. I will not have a political position because my time has ended, but I think I can join forces, forces of change, 
and forces of progress to be able to continue to do things for the country, even as it faces perhaps some of the most difficult days than they had in the past few years. I hope that I can use the strength of my leadership, joining with those uh, to continue to promote peace because peace and freedom were the two strong aspects of my legacy. And thank God that part of the legacy has remained today. Our people are still vibrant in thoughts and action and words. Our media is still open and peace still prevails going into its 20th consecutive year. Congratulations. My, my, my commitment me. is to work toward maintaining that legacy. What has kept you so young? You're not angry. That's not true. I am. No, <laughs> just the white hair. <laughs> what is the All trick? Right. <laughs> Hard work and eat your food with pepper. Pepper. But <laughs> <laughs> Let me get up. Thank you. Now you can help me get up. All right. Now you can see the age, you see? Ah, there you go. You say you don't see the age, you see. <laughs> How did you find the show today? I hope you liked it. Many thanks for watching Globe Traction and hope to catch up with you again next Saturday at 8.30 p.m. Kenyan time only on KTN News. And if you have a story you'd like to share with us, please don't hesitate. Write to us through Globetraction at standardmedia.co.ke or DM us on our social media platforms at Globetraction or at KTN News KE. You can also tap that follow button to me on my social media platforms at Pasil Telewa on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok and YouTube for more of behind the scenes. But until then, I hope to catch up with you again soon.